Jesus have obviously missed that. So death will be destroyed. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted. That's the Father who did put all the things under him. And when all things should be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject. He will abdicate his authority back to the Father, and he will dwell with us in eternity as our brother, as our older brother, the elder brother, our redeemer. So, the making all fo uh, foes their footstool, that is a reference to the same thing here. For no man is ascended into the heavens. David himself is not ascended into the heavens, right? We understand that. When's that going to happen when this happens? When will David get to, get, to the, get to actually go to heaven at the same time you and I go? If we're still alive when the Lord returns, we're, we're going to go as long as we're faithful. If we're dead and buried, we'll still go if we're faithful, aren't we? We'll still go if we live a faithful life. Then we will all go with him to heaven. He has not yet done it. He's not delivered the kingdom to the Father. The kingdom includes those on the right side of Hades. As well as the righteous living. Those will all be delivered to the Father at the end. And if you're not in the kingdom, you're not going to be delivered to the Father. So we understand the time marker in this verse. <clears throat> it hasn't happened yet. But it will. 2 Peter chapter 3, listen. These folks are, uh, uh, Peter's talking about giving them kind of a hard time about this. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. What's that a reference to? The flood of Noah's day, correct? Was that a, uh, a localized event? Or was that a worldwide event? Did that affect everyone? That affected everyone. Every human being died except for eight. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is that as one. That doesn't, it doesn't say that a thousand years is a day. It says time is of no relevance to God concerning his promise. His faithfulness knows no bounds as far as time is concerned. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us. Where Peter then explains why we still have time <clears throat> still have time. Not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Oh, that's talking about destruction of Jerusalem. Really? Well, you know, I find this interesting because Peter, in the foreshadow, speaking of this, of this great event that's, that's in focus, he says in the foreshadow that there is a worldwide cataclysm. And you're telling me that this worldwide cataclysm was the type of which the destruction of Jerusalem, which, by the way, was a local event, is the antitype. And I'm going to tell you, you don't understand types and antitypes. And you can't show me one other type antitype relationship in Scripture where the antitype is lesser in degree than the type. But, now if, if the destruction or if the destruction of the world in Noah's day is a foreshadow of a greater universal destruction to come, then that would certainly make sense. Verse 36. Therefore, therefore, in light of the arguments Peter has set forth so far, Let's go over those. Verses 16 through 21. The fulfillment of Joel's prophecy was the day of Pentecost. These events, verses 22 through 24, Jesus was who he claimed to be, and that was proven with power. Verses 25 through 28, Jesus is himself the fulfillment of David's prophecy. Verses 30 through 33, Jesus rose from the dead, proving his divinity. Therefore, based on the arguments presented so far, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Who is he, who's he speaking to? Who is he preaching to? Do we have any problem saying that he was preaching to Jews? What's the problem with that? That's who he was preaching to. Pentecost was a Jewish feast day. Guess who was there? Jews. Proselytes were there. Acts chapter 2 explains who was there. 
And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. There were proselytes there. There were people from every nation under heaven there who had proselyted into this religion. And they were taking part of this wonderful feast. And they were there on Jerusalem as instructed. I've got no problem telling you that the gospel went first to the Jews. Absolutely it did. But guess what? The very same gospel went to the Gentiles. And the Bible is so terribly plain on that. You, you really can't miss it. The gospel would go forth here first. Listen to what Jesus says before the events of Acts 2. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoove Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. Man, that's an interesting word. What's that say? Beginning at Jerusalem. Where would it start now? Jerusalem. So you mean to tell me the gospel would go first to the Jews, then it would go to others? Absolutely. That's what Romans 1.16 says. That's, that's what Luke 24 says. That's what Jesus would say. That's what you see in the book of Acts. As you see it introduced to the Jewish. You see it in the temple in Acts 3. You see it on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. You see it slightly going for, uh, forth from there. You see it in Acts chapter 8 going even into Samaria now. We're crossing those boundaries. We're getting out of just Jerusalem and just Jews. And we're getting into the mixed breed so to speak. We're getting into Samaritans. You know, the Samaritans were, were part of those problems. They had, they had mingled uh, with, the, uh, with the, the captives. And you had kind of a, a, a people that claimed to be part of this nation, yet they weren't of a pure bloodline and they didn't even speak the same language. You had terrible conflict and enmity between Jews and Samaritans. Guess where the gospel goes now? Samaritans. Where does it go then? Jew, uh, Gentiles, Acts 10. Is it a different gospel? Please, all you got to do is do a study of Acts 2 through 10. It's just, it's just nine chapters. Do those studies and you tell me that's a different gospel. And I'll tell you, you're not reading the Bible to get that. You need help. Acts 13 in Antioch. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken unto you. Where is he? He's in a synagogue. Who's he talking to? Jews. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation to the ends of the earth. You know what was in God's mind from eternity? Saving everyone who would come. Revelation chapter 22. Any who will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. You know that's an interesting invitation if Calvinism is true. Because Calvinism teaches that there's only... Uh, there's only limited atonement, that only the elect are, are the, uh, the called, that you couldn't change if you wanted to. Why, what's the, what's the, why would we preach the gospel? What's the point of evangelism? Oh, well, hey, man, why don't you come and obey the gospel? Well, I can. I'm not elect. Well, sorry for you, pal. I am. Have a nice day. Garbage. It's pure garbage. All right, so we, we understand the house of Israel, who we're talking about. I like this. Not just no. You know, John uses the word know a lot. Not N-O as in eh, eh but know as in understand, perceive, right? John says that you may know, that you may know, that you may know, that you may know. We know. We know where we stand with God. And, I, you know, I, I find that interesting sometimes. I've got all these friends out there that I know are part of denominations and I know for a fact that they haven't actually done what the Bible teaches nor do they believe what the Bible teaches and they're just as solid in their convictions as they could possibly, they just, oh man, there's no doubt in my mind. And I'm like, well, how are you so confident? Well, I just, I just know. Well, how do you know? It's a feeling. Or I, I mean, I was right there and, and I saw the Holy Spirit. He just descended on me like a dove just like he did. I'm like, really? Well, here's what I find interesting is I know based on objective truth and my reaction to it. And I've heard people say that I wouldn't trade this feeling for a room full of Bibles. I wouldn't change the truth for a room full of feelings. That's all I want. I don't care about the feeling. It, it, Lan and I were talking about that earlier. You can have a feeling of comfort and assuredness based on truth. You don't need anything else. If, if I know I've been forgiven of my sins... That's a comfort to me, isn't it? Not that I think I have. Well, I think I might have. I, I think I'm probably okay. No. It's I know for a fact where I stand. Not based on any 
feelings or, or well, God answered my prayers or any perceptions or, or anything like that. No, it's, it's 100% based on God's Word. I know I've done exactly what God wants me to do, and I'm still striving to do so. Therefore, I know exactly where I stand. That, that, that is something that, that you can't trade for anything. Not just know, but know assuredly. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Absolutely no doubt. Proven by evidence. Acts 1.3 To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible. That's an interesting word. Guess who's not infallible? The Pope. Guess who claims is infallible? The Pope. Guess what? He ain't. God's infallible. God's word is a... Is a uh, is an extension of His will to man. That is His will, an extension of His mind to man in written form. The Word of God is infallible. It is the absolute truth and it's unchanging. He showed Himself alive after His passion, that is after His death, by many infallible proofs. That is, they cannot be spoken against. There is no doubt being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom. Acts 1-3, reference... Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20. Paul says, And that he was buried, and he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain under this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James and all the apostles, and last of all he was seen also of me. One born out of due time. Look at all the eyewitness. Do you know what you have to be convicted in a court. You know what God said you had to be convicted? You know, uh, you remember Hebrews 10? Where it says that uh, uh, under the law of Moses, you would die without mercy under the hand of two or three witnesses. You know what it took to condemn a man? Two voices of opposition in agreement. I saw Eddie do that. Jerry says, I saw Eddie do that. Hey, Eddie. Sorry, whether you did it or not, you got some opposition. Now you better be able to prove her false witnesses or you're getting stoned. If two or three is sufficient to bring about a conviction, how about 500? How about 40 days of evidence? Pretty powerful. That God hath made this same Jesus. We're talking about let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus. Look at this interesting word here. Made. In what way was Jesus made? We covered it in Hebrews 1. Is Jesus, are the Jehovah's Witnesses right? Is Jesus, Jesus a created being? You know that angels... The angelic beings, that is the heavenly messengers that we think of when the word angel is spoken, we think of these heavenly beings. Guess what they are? Created beings. They're greater than you and I, aren't they? They're mightier than we are, absolutely. Very interesting to think about and to study. But guess what? They're created beings. Jesus is deity. Deity is not created. Deity is self-existent. That's what Jehovah means. De deity has always been and will always be deity is that its very essence eternal. All right, so it isn't when we're talking about Jesus being made, that doesn't mean that, well, yeah, way back then God created Jesus and then through Jesus everything else. No, that's not what it means at all because way back when God was with Jesus. He didn't create Jesus. Jesus has always been there with him, sharing his nature and his glory. But we understand that Jesus was made in a certain way, wasn't he? Jesus, an eternal spirit, left heaven and entered into the womb of Mary and grew there as a child. And this child was born into this world and the eternal spirit, the eternal word that was once in heaven was now inhabiting an infant. And that infant grew. And then he was a young man and then he was a teenager, right? Then he was, you know, a teenager, then a young man, excuse me. Then he was uh, this mature man. That's how he was made. There's no other way in which he was made. He was made that way. Jesus dwelt in a human body, okay? We need to understand that there's, there's the aspect of being made here is that this speaks of his exaltation. So when, when Jesus was on earth, 
We knew that he was the anointed one. We knew that he was the Savior, but he had yet to accomplish those acts. Everybody agree with me so far? When Jesus was born in the manger, we knew that this was going to be the Savior of the world. But was he at this point anointed with power? He was anointed with power in a certain place, right? When John baptized him. You don't read of anything Jesus did before his baptism that had anything to do with power. As far as we know, he was a human being. Basically regular human. I mean, he was deity, but he was a human being. At John's baptism of Jesus, the Holy Spirit came on him, and then he began to perform miracles. When we're talking about anointed, we're talking about that he was anointed with power, and then he demonstrated that he was, in fact, the Savior of the world. And in accomplishing his duty or his role, he was exalted. So when we're talking about he was made Lord in Christ, we understand that he had this authority. But the way that they use the word made is, this speaks of him doing his, his role as Redeemer, him accomplishing this, and then him being exalted as Lord in Christ. Savior, the anointed one. It happened at a specific time. Hebrews 1, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I'll be to him a father, and he'll be to me a son. And again when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, Let all the angels of God worship him. He was made so much better than the angels. When? Well, Hebrews 2 9 says, But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. So, uh, you know what? We, do we have a contradiction? No, we're talking about different time frames. Hebrews 2 9 speaks of his birth. Hebrews 1 4 speaks of his death and his resurrection and his ascension. Simply different time frames. He was made lower than the angels in that he was simply a human being. He was, he was a man. I'm not saying he was only a man. He also was deity. We know that. But for all intents and purposes, to be tempted with sin and to overcome this, he was a man. And he was a man, and, and by definition, men are lower than angels. So don't tell me that he was exalted higher than angels before his death, because he wasn't. Oh, he's Jesus. Absolutely he's Jesus. Then he proved it. But he was not exalted in the manger, and he wasn't exalted on the earth, and he wasn't even exalted on the cross. He was exalted after he died and was buried and ascended to the Father. That's when... And that's what we're talking about him. The word made gives us a time reference. God hath made this Jesus whom you've crucified. Not before, but because of the fact that you crucified him and he rose from the grave. He proved that he is the Lord. And he is the anointed one, the Christ. The Savior of the world. So we need to understand that time reference, right? That's what, that's what this is about. Hebrews 2.14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might deliver them, who through fear of death had, uh, had all their lifetime, they were subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, that is, he became a man so that he could die. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. No man, Jesus, no reconciliation. Why? Because it was a man that had blood, and the man had to shed that blood, and the man had to die. When did this happen? While he was on earth? At the very end of his life, isn't it? So the time frame for him being Lord in Christ... Well, does that mean that there's a contradiction in, in, the, in the disciples and us referring to him as the Lord while he was on earth? No, because we know who he was. The point is, is that this was an official exaltation based upon his events after they happened. And especially in light of them preaching to the very ones that crucified him. Imagine how you'd feel when you realized you crucified the Son of God. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect for then would they not cease to be offered. For the worshippers once purged would have had no more conscience of sin but in those sacrifices that is under the law there is a remembrance again uh, made of sin every year. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, uh, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. He goes on now to explain, In burnt offerings and, and offerings for sin, thou had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he saith, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, listen, which are offered by the law. 
Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. I take away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified by the offering of the body of Christ once for all. This is the point at which, right? Remember, this is the point. When he hath made one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down. Right? I've done the work. Now the exaltation comes. That's what Philippians 2 says also. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, based on the fact that we just spoke, that is why God highly exalted him. When? You understand the time reference, because had he not humbled himself to the, to the death of the cross, he would not have been exalted. So we understand the time reference being he lived his life, he did so perfectly every day of his life. Yes, that was an eternal spirit inhabiting an, an actual human body. Yes, he lived in subjection to his father and he did it for one purpose. And then because he trusted in God and he commended his soul into his hands and because he died for us as a sacrifice, God exalted him. You guys crucified Jesus. And he said he was the son of God. And God showed you that he was the son of God. Let you know this right now. God made him Lord in Christ. And guess what? He's the one that's going to judge you. Men and brethren, what shall we do? I'd ask that question too, wouldn't you? Thus, through absolute submission, he was exalted. Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Jesus, whom you crucified. John 18 through 19. He would be made both Lord, that is, uh, Mr., respectful. Uh, that, that, is a, that is a word that is not exclusive to deity or to Jesus. That's a word that's used a lot, and it's simply it's a simple uh, role of authority. And then Christ, that is exclusively of Jesus. That is the anointed one. Jesus was made Lord in Christ when he was resurrected and when he ascended to the Father. Verses 30 through 33, reference Hebrews 1, Matthew 28, and all those others that we referenced tonight. I'd like to take this opportunity to extend the invitation. If there are any here this evening that have never obeyed the gospel, you must hear the word of God and believe it, repent of your sins, confess Christ before men, be baptized for the remission of sins, and live faithful to him, walking in harmony with his will. For those who have obeyed the gospel, if you are not faithful, acknowledge your sin in prayer to God. He'll forgive you. If you need our prayers, we'll pray for you, and God will forgive if you're willing to repent. The invitation is yours as we sing this song. Please consider your condition. Please come now as we stand and as we sing.